I promise you that in today's conversation with Sean O'Toole, founder and CEO at Property Radar, I had every intention of discussing digital marketing and the tech side of real estate investing, but naturally my fascination with finding undervalued real estate opportunities got the better of me. And so instead, you're going to hear a discussion about how real estate markets behave during their cycles and what to watch for to capitalize on market inefficiencies. Hello, Adam Gower here, and you are listening to the Gower Crowd podcast, real estate syndication in the digital age at gowercrowd.com. Sean O'Toole, my guest, is definitively a tech guy who discovered a love of real estate investing and found that there was a gap in the way that information was disseminated that made it really inefficient for him to find good investment opportunities. Being a tech guy, he created a system at first to use himself, but eventually realizing he could monetize it to consolidate data into easy to consume visual format. Put another way, he created a platform that helps you actually visualize where the deals are and then allows you to drill down and get all the information that you need to actively pursue them. Now, of course, that's all well and good to find great real estate investment opportunities, but if you don't have the capital to buy them, you're not going to get very far. So to solve that quandary, I too have created a system, though mine helps you raise capital once you've found your deals. I walk you through the entire system in enough detail that you can build one yourself in a white board workshop that you can access at gowercrowd.com. You'll also find access to it on the podcast page for today's episode where I've included links to Sean's company and other resources that we discussed today, all there at gowercrowd.com. Now, in today's episode, you're going to hear a discussion about how liquidity in the market affects real estate prices, what indicators to watch for to find opportunities, why post hoc ergo propter hoc is a fallacy, enter asterisk the goal, and a whole lot more with my guest, tech expert, real estate expert, and Latin scholar, Sean O'Toole. Sean, fabulous to see you. Thank you so very much for coming on my podcast. Now, you and I met in the aftermath of the last downturn, the global financial crisis, the GFC, the Great Recession, whatever it's turned to be called now. <laughs> and what I remember so specifically was I discovered your website, Property Radar. I thought, wow, look at this thing. This is an amazing platform. And I wrote to customer support and who answered none other than the owner of the company himself, Sean O'Toole. I was so impressed and enjoyed talking to him. What I'd like to ask you about what's going on today is, well, actually, is what, what are you seeing going on today, to be specific? The world has changed. What's happening in this crazy COVID world based on what you're seeing? Yeah, that's a, that's a really big, uh, a big question. There's a lot going on. And, um, and a lot we don't know yet, right? It's going to take a little while to, uh, to play out. But uh, thanks for having me on your uh, podcast. Excited to be here and good to reconnect uh, as well. So I'll tell you what, tell me first then, what is actually, your, just explain to the one guy out there who doesn't know what Property Radar is. <laughs> tell me, what is your secret sauce? Because it is really quite special, isn't it? Tell me about that and then, let, then let's talk about trends. Yeah, you know, I was a, a tech guy in Silicon Valley, three uh, venture-backed startups. And after the dot-com crash, I ended up flipping houses and flipped 150 houses. And, um, you know, I always joke with all my Silicon Valley friends that, you know, the best thing I ever did for my software career was to get out of Silicon Valley and work on solving my own problem rather than somebody else's problem. And so Property Radar, you know, started off as a tool for me to use in my own investing. Um, I realized how much value there was in public records and uh, became an expert in public records and title and pulling that data together to 
um, help me identify and qualify uh, opportunities. So we're public records data experts. And um, you know, if you do anything in the business of real estate, the one of the best things about the real estate business is you can know every potential customer by name and you can know lots about them, what size house they're in, how much equity they have, who their lenders are, all kinds of stuff. And uh, if you're in this business, it, it really is, you know, it, it's your lifeblood. All right, so Sean, I'm gonna have to interrupt you because you're a public records expert, sounds incredibly boring. <laughs> but <laughs> you make it so fabulously intuitive to understand this data. Please, for those who haven't seen the website, I do encourage people to go there. I'm not being paid to do that, by the way. Yeah. It, really is a, it really is fabulous. There's this one graphic on your homepage where you have a, uh, it looks like an Excel spreadsheet with the massively boring data on it that, that kind of your head blows up. And you've got this little uh, kind Slider. of a dial thing that you slide across and it shows you how your platform converts that. Just explain that a little. Uh, what exactly are you doing? How do you make it not boring and intuitively easy to use? Yeah, so you know, you get all this data, right? And it is, it's that big boring spreadsheet and that's how it's been sold for years. And it's just not very useful. And so we wanted to make the data useful and visual and so we take it and we put it in, uh, layer it on in colorful heat maps where, you know, you can see an entire market. You can see where the rentals are and where the high end homes are and where there's equity and where there's not equity, where there's foreclosures, where there's sales. And you can see that for like, you know, all of Sacramento, right? You can the, the old. Um, the retirement communities stand out. The you know you, you could just visual visually see those things, and then you can drill down to the street level, and on your phone while you're driving down the street, it'll show you. Oh, that house has equity. That one doesn't. Right? Those folks are really underwater, and uh, so we just tried to make everything really visual, intuitive, um, and, and and friendly because you know. Why not, right? Nobody wants to look at a spreadsheet. Exactly. So now let's say I want to take a look at all the apartment buildings. Let's say yeah. <clears throat> five units and above in a particular area. Tell me what kind of research can I do on your website that, for that kind of property? Yeah, so we have over 200 criteria and property type is one of them. So you can say go to apartment five plus or, you know, uh, the multifamily two to four as well as a whole bunch of other categories, right? But you go to apartment five plus. Now, it, it does depend a little bit on the county, right? Because some counties are really good with their data and, and ultimately we're aggregating this public records data. So in, in some counties, like you'll know exactly how many units, how many, you know, bedrooms and how many bathrooms and you can see how many beds and baths on average per unit. In other counties, some of that may be missing, you'll know how many square feet it is, what the size of the lot is, who the owner is, what mortgage or debt they have on it, you know, so lots and lots of uh, pieces and you can build search criteria around any of those things. So, you know, if you're looking for, you know, 10 to 20 unit uh, things in certain neighborhoods, that, that really just becomes draw a circle around the neighborhood, put in the number of units you want, get the results and it pops out so you so it's uh, so it's really it's amazing isn't it so you what pops out is a list of all those properties the addresses the owners how much they owe who their lender is yeah uh and their name and email address yeah so yeah if, uh, um we definitely pull in email addresses and phone numbers for a lot of folks um on the commercial side, right, uh, a lot of those are held in LLCs. So there, there can be a little extra step there where you need to go look up who owns the LLC and then you can get the phones and emails. But yes, for sure. And, and let's talk about marketing. How, as you know, the, my business is, is marketing. So we'll, let's yeah. talk about how you've been marketing your business over the years. Because I remember when we spoke, however long ago it was, that you, you were doing some very interesting stuff. But for now, 
Tell me, with the onset of COVID, the last three months, what are you seeing in terms of, let's say, traffic to your site or usage patterns, how people are using the site? What are you seeing in terms of trends uh, that it maybe informs what's going on in the market a little? Yeah. So in, at least in terms, I mean, obviously, we've got all the data on the real estate market, too. But um, in terms of our own, what we saw, right, we definitely saw uh, most of our customers are small businesses, right? So they're real estate investors, realtors, mortgage brokers, home services companies, right? Commercial brokers. So, um, and by and large, all those folks are small businesses and they've been disproportionately hit. So we saw a lot of concern, a lot of panic, a lot of pulling back, you know, early on, which I think is, is pretty normal, right? And so a lot of people saying, hey, I, I love your site, but can you pause my subscription for a while? Things like that. Um, so, you know, we definitely took a hit like uh, a, a lot of folks. Um, and then I started getting all the calls from, you know, we had a lot of large companies buy uh, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars use of foreclosure using our service. Cause that's really where we got our start was in the foreclosure market. And so within a week, I probably got half a dozen phone calls from folks going, hey, I've raised $100 million for a special opportunity fund. And, um, you know, we're going to spin up, you know, as foreclosures start, we want to spin up 50 folks. And, uh, you know, we need them all to have your site. And uh, we hear you're going national. How soon will you be in these other three markets that we want to be in? Um, so I got a lot of those calls and we still, um, the traffic around the, the foreclosures, you know, those keywords um, is up uh, substantially. Um, foreclosures are not up substantially. They're largely in moratorium still, but a lot of interest around that. So that's, that's, that's some of what we saw. And then I think, you know, over the, you know, kind of the last 30 days, we saw people go, you know what, I need to get back to work. And so those folks that paused, unpaused their subscription, they're back to work. Um, and I think people are realizing, you know, in most markets, uh, sale prices are up, not down in a lot of markets. Inventory's way down, demand is down, but inventory's down more. And so if you wanna buy right now, and there are still buyers, you don't have a lot to choose from and you kind of got to pay full price and we don't have motivated sellers at the moment. Why do you think that is? Do you think people are just anticipating, just hanging on and figuring it's just going to bounce straight back? Uh, you know, I think there's, there's a few things, right? Like you still need a place to live. Like this is the underlying thing about the real estate market, right? Like um, you still need a place to live and we have not been building enough homes. So, okay, maybe you're in over your head a little bit on this house, but the lenders by and large are gonna work with you on forbearances and stuff, right? Um, you, you don't really wanna go out and shop, you know, what are you gonna, if you're gonna downsize or rent, you gotta go out into the world and go shop. You're probably gonna shelter in place. That's what you're being told to do. You got a forbearance on your mortgage, you're getting some help on your rent. Like, uh, you know, so there's no, there's no pressure to sell, right? Like if you look at past times when we've had big downward market pressure, right? There's been a fundamental pressure to sell, right? So in the nineties, we had builders build too much inventory and they had to discount stuff to get it sold. And it was an, it was an oversupply issue, right? And then in the 2008 crisis, we forced banks to get rid of assets and they had to sell those assets at any price. So they took back a lot of foreclosures where people said, I'm not gonna pay this ridiculous price, you know, payment anymore. They gave those homes back to the bank intentionally. And, and then the banks put those on the market and they just kept lowering the prices until they sold. At the same time, they removed credit from the market. So there were fewer buyers, right? Uh, credit's tightened up a little bit for sure right now. Um, but we don't have that motivated seller in the market. And there's still a question, you know, a lot of small businesses are, are in a lot of in, you know, trouble. Unemployment rates are super high. Well, we see that down the road. 
you know, it's still possible, but it, it, it will be slow. So let's, in comparison to the 2008 downturn, 2008-2009 downturn, yeah. now you mentioned that this time, very, very quickly you started to get calls from people saying, I've got 100 million of cash that I want to invest and I want to get 50 people with licenses on your site immediately. That sounds like it's a bit different from the 2008 downturn. Tell me, just describe what you saw then and how it is different now. And what I'm really headed at is what is the, the, the degree to which there is liquidity actually in the market that may yeah. keep these you know, prices that may not force prices down? Yeah, I, I just don't see it. You know, so I come back to the, the 2008 crisis. So at the end of 2005, I'm flipping houses. I probably have 20 homes in inventory, right? And I'm going, I don't want to be in this market. Like these sales that I'm making make no sense. The folks buying them can't afford these homes. This doesn't end well. And so I decided to exit at the end of 2005, spent the first half of 2006 getting rid of my inventory, and then uh, started on foreclosure radar, which then later became property radar. And so end of 2005 is when I made that call, right? And said, I see distress in this market. I see a problem. Mid-2007, Ben Bernanke still saying, hey, it's just a subprime crisis. It's not going to be a big deal. We've got it, con you know, uh, constrained. Don't worry about it, right? And, uh, and it really wasn't until September 2008 that people went, oh, crap we've got a problem, right? So two and a half years later, two and three quarters years later, right? Before it really blew up from where many of us first saw it. Um, and then the money really didn't come into the market in terms of the Blackstones and the Waypoints and, and the rest until 2009 and into 2010. You know, so that's, that's another year plus later before they even identified the opportunity and, you know, that's a year after there's blood in the streets. Plus, there were, there were far fewer, well, there were no small investors, or very, very few early on. It yeah. really was a, it was a slow build before it reached that kind of frenzy point. In California, we, we always talk about the 40 feeds, right? Like, pre-2008, pre there was probably 40 real trustee sale buyers in the state of California, Right. Um, we probably had around 10,000 um, active trustee sale buyers as customers at the peak. <laughs> so you went from 40 people doing the business to 10,000. That's incredible. Yeah. That's me. All right. So then what's happened since then? Tell me what's happened since then. And, and, and yeah, describe the pattern over the last 10 years then. Well, so, you know, what we are right now is we're in a, in a period of crisis followed by reflation, right? So we had a crisis in 2000, the dot-com bubble, which I felt very personally because I was definitely a dot-com got kid, right? <laughs> and, um, and then it, that was followed by reflation, right? So the Fed came in and reflated the economy. Um, a lot of people said that would lead to inflation, but when you've got deflation, plus these monetary policies, they, if done right, they balance each other out and you get reflation without inflation. That's what we saw after 2000, that's what we saw after 2008, and that's what we're seeing now, right? So it's, it, unfortunately, it's getting a little bigger each time and it's increasing our sovereign debt and our overall debt levels each time. You know, ideally when you have a, a bubble like this, you would wipe out you know, debt and kind of reset things. Last time that really happened was the Carter administration, right? Where they let inflation go and wiped out debt and we had a debt deflation. And that really set us up for, you know, from 1980 to today, 40 years of growth. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, he and Volcker uh, may have been uh, the most adults uh, or the, yeah, most adult uh, leadership we've had uh, in my lifetime anyways. Um, 
because it did it set us up for success right now each of these we're setting ourselves up for failure right like uh, if you read like what way? explain you know, that yeah change of, change of world order some people are predicting you know I, I, i'm i don't think that'll come soon but um it's it's not a good pattern uh okay so I kind of lost your thread there a little bit. Right, that's uh, all right. it's, we, we talk, you talk about kind of general economic or macroeconomic ideas. And how does that... F so the implication is that the reflating of the, uh, of the economy... And I, you didn't say this, but I think by inference, this is what you were talking about. You're talking about the trillions of dollars that have been pumped in to try and shore up the economy is that right? Yeah. And so, where yeah. do you think that's gonna? Where do you think that's gonna take us? And you know, not just kind of some hypothetical, very, very long-term next generation thing, but in the months and short years to come. Yeah. yeah. We've seen exactly where it takes us because it happened after the dot-com bubble, and it happened after two thousand eight, and we're doing it again, bigger, but we're doing it again, and a, a few things come out of it, you know, each time, right? Uh, one, you blow some new bubbles, right? You're putting an awful lot of money into the economy and it doesn't necessarily go where you think it's going to go. Um, generally, it's very bullish for assets, right? It, uh, it can take a little while or whatever, but, you know, these reflationary policies are tend to be good for real estate. They tend to be good for stocks, right? They tend to be good for exotic cars and art, right? Um, they tend to increase the wealth gap. Right, which I think with the protests and stuff that we're seeing going on right now, we're seeing some of the aftermath of, of that, right? So that's one of the downsides of this kind of reflationary uh, policy, right? Is the money doesn't go always where it's intended. And for those guys sitting on uh, big cash that can take advantage of, you know, uh, the things that the wealth gap's going to increase. Like, and what do you think that's good, the impact of that is going to be on commercial real estate? I mean, I would, I would like to ask, actually, what do you think should happen? But now we get into really serious hypotheticals. But we're, based on what there is going on. For, for real estate, right, we can get, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of things we can look at, right? So on the demand side, right, we're seeing an increase in work from home, right? So good for residential real estate bad potentially for office, right? Like some of these things are just fairly off, obvious, right? I think we'll see people have just spent a lot of time in their homes for the first time, right? A lot of people don't spend time at their homes. They get up in the morning, they go to work, maybe they go work out, they go out to dinner, they come home and go to bed. And now you just spent 24 hours in a place that you've really never had to do that before. And I guarantee some people are looking around going, oh, holy, sh what am I doing in this dump right? <laughs> or whatever, right? And why I am, am I in this city when I can work from home? And why, why aren't I living where I want to live in the house I want to live in, right? Um, that's going to create demand for some product and create, uh, you know, supply for other product, right? Like, I don't know that I would want to own high density housing in urban settings right now, whereas probably desirable rural suburban areas, right, are probably going to get a lot more popular in the coming months. Um, so we can kind of just, you know, we can walk through these things kind of logically, like, so a move from density to less density is likely, right? I think on the demand side, we're also just like we saw people sit in houses they may not like anymore. They may be sitting with somebody that they decide they don't like enough to spend this much time with. And I think we'll see household separations and that will increase demand. I see more things on the demand side, you know, the increasing demand that I see um, increasing supply. So that's where I don't expect to see a big downturn. Maybe in certain things like high density urban, um, you might see an oversupply and a price drop, right? Rents are down in San Francisco right now, as an example, uh, like 15%. Um, whereas you're seeing strong rent demand in more rural uh, or suburban 
uh, areas. So I, I think all these things are, you know, if you think them through, they're just, they're, they're fairly obvious. And uh, Sean, do you track this kind of thing on your own website just to kind of keep in touch with what's going on? Yeah, so, you know, we have uh, data on every single sale, every mortgage, every, you know, move, et cetera. So, yeah, we absolutely are looking at that, right? And, you know, definitely uh, a, a little bit of a downturn in March, a fairly big drop in sales in April. But again, sales volume, not price. Um, and that just makes sense, right? Because people sheltered in place and were less likely to go look for a home. And so, um, you know. and, so, and your heat maps will also show where overall prices are tending down and where they're tending up. Is that right? Um, you know, we certainly have heat maps on estimated values so you can see what values are in various areas. Yeah, for sure. And, and uh, but I mean, trends in certain areas. Like, could I look and see where red, you know, on a map of California, red means prices are going down, green, they're coming up. So that's maybe where I want to go and invest. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. We don't actually have that one right now, but, uh, but we can add it, you know, we, in one of my presentations, do you remember the scene in, um, uh, what's the Austin Powers movie where there's the security guard going, and there's a, and there's the steamroller coming at him, right? And he's yelling, stop. And the steamroller is coming at him, right? Super like slow, right? Yeah. Super slow. That's the real estate market. Like people think this stuff changes fast. It never has in history, right? Like come back to 2008 where people are like, oh my God, prices dropped so fast, right? It, they didn't. It started at the end of 2005, sales started to slow, right? It's people just weren't paying attention. Like, but it was, it was working its way down and there was an impact. Um, and, and it's not all individuals fault. Like, so for example, we all look at uh, median price charts, right? And this was really one of the things that got me started on this, this company and this journey is, you know, I'm selling these properties off at the, in, in 2005 when I, at, or beginning of 2006 when I see a problem. And prices are going down across the board, right? I have high-end homes and I have low-end homes and prices are going down across the board. And I open up the local newspaper and it shows the median price going up. And I'm like, the news, news is wrong, right? Fake news or whatever, right? Well, it, it's not, it's just simple math. And what was happening was there were fewer sales happening at the low end than at the high end, right? And because of that, you had mix shift going on where a higher percentage of the sales were at the high end. Well, that moves the median up, even though the price at the high end was coming down. That, I think that was really one of the things that kept Bernanke and everybody else from seeing how big a problem this was in 2008. Because at the same time we had prices coming down, we had mix shift towards higher end homes and that it made it look like the market was doing fine when it was in serious trouble. And that probably went on for almost two years before. So do you think there's anything similar now? Are there any similar indicators that are being misread? No, uh, I don't think so yet. We are not seeing that particular thing where prices are coming down, but median still coming up. And, and I will yell that from the rooftops the second I see it, because I am now trained to look for that. Sean, you know, uh, I had wanted to talk to you about marketing, uh, but we have already had a, we have a full uh, serving of podcast and conversation that has gone unbelievably fast. It's such a fascinating subject and you're such an insightful fellow because of all the data that you have and what you see and et cetera. And especially your background actually in tech is particularly interesting to me. Yeah. Uh, because of this intersection between real estate and tech is the intersection that I'm in. You yeah. From the real estate, you come at it from the tech perspective. I come at it from real estate. It's really a fascinating, very small little intersection, but very, <laughs> very, it's like the seed that powers everything, you know, these days. It's so important. But we are at the end, and I don't want to take up too much of your time. But do you mind if I ask you three quick sign-off questions? 
Okay, and I'll, I'll try to keep my answers short. I know I'm not good at that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, ter I'm terribly verbose. You get me talking, I'll never bloody stop. <laughs> all right, so three quick sign-up questions I ask all of my guests. And I'm going to ask you this as a tech guy. So what key, da key daily habits, and actually my interest is particularly uh, in the online world, right? So you're sitting there in somewhere the middle of nowhere i'm fairly sure of it you've been there for a long time running a business it's amazing that's exactly what i do so you are very much a remote worker right your world is online so uh, it, what daily habits do you have that keep you successful online daily habits of keeping successful online um i Unfortunately, I'm, st I'm of the age where I'm still email centric. And so one is I treat my inbox as a to-do list and I, clean I do my best to have it cleaned out at the end of, of every uh, day, right? I don't want to leave open conversations. And it doesn't always happen, but that's, that's the goal. And uh, to try to get back to folks, especially right now when we're remote, right? Responding and getting back to people, um, I think is is super important. It's hard to do it, especially across all the social channels and stuff. But but I do try. I try to get back to folks. Second question: What has well, actually, the what has been the hardest lesson you've learned online, uh, including social and kind of just your online world? Online world, hardest lesson. Um, you know, this one's very cliche, right? But like, um, I am the son of a logic professor, right? And uh, I think a core thing that we're missing today is the lack of critical thinking, um, the understanding of uh, fallacious arguments, right? An ad hominem attack is a fallacious argument. It's a sign of weakness to me, right? Um, this happened, therefore that happened, right? Post hoc ergo propter hoc is a fallacy, right? Just because two things followed in time doesn't mean one caused the other, right? Like I am constantly thinking that way and it is, it is, it takes a lot of discipline for me not to try to correct everyone on the internet, right? Like somebody <laughs> said, on the internet, I need to fix it, right? Like what a torment. You are a tormented man. <laughs> I am very, very tormented, right? It's very hard for me to go online and look at so the, the lack of critical thinking um, in the world. I'm not just going to blame the US right now, like, and the inability to make sound logical arguments I, like i'm convinced we need to teach that in elementary school because it is so missing in society right now whether you're talking about covid or any of these things like mm, it's just super you know fun. i'll tell you i have to sean so i definitely think exactly the same though i don't often think in latin occasionally i do <laughs> but not very often but I do think there is actually one thing missing from that. And, uh, you know, if you approach the world from a strictly logical perspective, I think that can be a terrible yeah. struggle because on the, for, for somebody who, I always used to think of it like this, the hardest person to play backgammon with, I play backgammon and backgammon is a highly logical price, strictly arithmetic right? or, or, or data, stat statistic, percentages, probability. It's people say it's the role of the dice. No, it isn't. It's you've got to know exactly what pit counts are, etc. It is very, very logical, yeah. and very fast. And the hardest person to play against, I always found, was somebody who doesn't use logic. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. That's the wrong move. <laughs> That's wrong. <laughs> But no, they want to play. It's always throw me off. Right? Right, and, bloody, right. and then they get lucky. And it drives me mad. <laughs> but, but there is something to be said about the power of chaos in, in, in the world and the, and the fact that chaos um, exists means that it can only be tapped by something that somebody who sees only logic is confused by. 
and that when you tap into that, you you use a different kind of logic to control. I, yeah. as, as I like to say, we are not thinking machines that feel, and this isn't mine, you know, but we are feeling machines, you know, that think, right? So um, we are emotional, emotionally driven creatures, not logically driven. Um, you know, so I, I fully agree and, and respect that and, and understand that. And, um, uh, but boy, you know, it would be nice if there was, you know, logic will help us get to solutions and help us find common ground. Um, and so I still wish there was more of it. Yeah, I agree with you. And before I go to my final question for you, there is my dear father. Uh, does like to say that the most, and he, of course, he's 100 and something years old or whatever, but so he lived in a different era, right? When he yeah. was talking about this, but he said, I love the television. He said, I love it because it has this one amazing button on it that when you press it, it goes off. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. So the best way <laughs> to yeah. avoid it all, switch the damn thing off. <laughs> the heck. <laughs> Life will go on. Life goes but, on. <laughs> my last question uh advice for somebody right so thinking back to real estate advice for somebody looking to invest in commercial real estate today what advice would you give them oh uh, i think you know especially right now uh the uh, i have bought very little that was listed for sale um and, you know, usually that best property, the thing that you're most excited about is not the one that's currently for sale or on the market. And, uh, for example, um, you know, I wanted to buy apartments and, uh, rather than look, I did look at what was listed, right? Cause that's obviously very easy, but you know, uh, I knew the market I wanted to be in and I identified every apartment and I reached out and talked to every single owner and kind of found out what was going on with them, whether they were interested in selling or not, and um, ended up uh, finding somebody who's like, you know, I don't want to deal with listing and I am thinking about selling. And we had a good conversation and found an agreeable price. And, uh, you know, I got a property that I wouldn't have ever gotten. So, uh, Embrace, embrace the off market, right? I think too many people constrain their view. Even when I'm, you know, uh, even where I'm sitting right now, right, off market. Uh, and, uh, you know, I love, 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 love my uh, location. And I would not have found it if I had constrained myself to what was listed for sale. Sean O'Toole property radar thank you so very much for your time with me today yeah it's great thank you appreciate you having me that was founder and ceo of property radar sean o'toole i've included links to sean's firm property radar and his online professional profiles on the podcast page for today's episode at gowercrowd.com where you'll also find access to the investor acquisition system master course that you can roll in so you can raise money online for your deals, no matter what you are investing in. That's all there at gowercrowd.com. All right, that's it. Thanks so much for listening. And thank you, Sean O'Toole, for your time with me today. I do hope that you like Asterix as much as I do. That's all for this episode. I'll see you next time. And in the meantime, stay well. And for now, this is Dr. Adam Gower signing off. <laughs>